from a warm, safe place and thrust into a world we have no way of comprehending. Childhood is a constant routine of punishment and confusion. Hell, we're depressed and misunderstood as teenagers and then frightened and unprepared as we become adults. In midlife, we watch as our youth slowly slips away, our dreams for greatness becoming pathetic memories. Old age brings loneliness infirmity, and the constant fear of death. Hi, I'm Rick Reynolds. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. Let me be frank and candid with you. This is the culmination of two years of my life. We have two runs at this, this afternoon and, this, and tonight. This afternoon sucked miserably. <laughs> It is up to you to salvage my career. Um, I understand there are cameras everywhere. There's a guy right there, which is bizarre to me. And there's lights are really bright. I will sweat a lot. None of that is important. There's only one thing that's important in this show. You have to trust me. You have to close your eyes and fall backwards into my arms. And it is a trust, I assure you, I will not take lightly. I make you this promise right now, and please believe me, I mean this. I will not lie to you once tonight. I will stretch your credulity. You will at times wonder if that could possibly be true. Please go with me on this journey. I'll make this really easy. We will start with some very, very simple things to believe. And we'll build. My name is Rick. <laughs> That's not hard, is it? My full name is Rick Randall Reynolds. I was born in Portland, Oregon on December 13th, 1951. I am unbelievably to myself 40 years old. I stand six feet, two and a half inches tall. I weigh probably 200 uh, pounds by this time. I have a very big nose. I have very large hands. I believe my penis to be average size. <laughs> I am losing my hair, obviously. I would be totally bald at this point in my life if I hadn't paid thousands and thousands of dollars years ago for hair transplants, for this wispy bit of crap up here. <laughs> I am vain. I'm really vain. I care way too much what you are thinking about me right at this instant. I do not believe in God. In fact, I'll tell you the truth. God does not exist. I know it for a fact. I hope he doesn't hold that against me later. <laughs> but these are my convictions. <laughs> I am married. I've been married 10 years. I love my wife, Lisa Ludwigson, more than I could ever express with words. Even though the bitch wouldn't take my last name, I love her very much. <laughs> I collect old records. Now, I bring that up now because I spend so much time with them. I spend so much time thinking on them and working on them and cleaning them. I am so obsessive. I have 50,000 records at home. I, you know, I'm glad I have no major bad habits to obsess over. Um, I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't do drugs. I do sugar. I do massive amounts of sweets. I don't understand how you can get to be an adult in charge of your own life and not eat all the damn sugar you can. There are people like this. Do you know people that can take like a big bowl of M&Ms, put them out on their coffee table as though they were a decoration of some sort? <laughs> Weeks go by, they don't touch them, dust is collecting. What kind of soulless zombies are these people? They're, they're the same people who will slice the tiniest piece of fudge you have ever seen in your life. And they'll take a little nibble and go, oh, that is rich. <laughs> Right, then I'll chisel out a four-inch square slab and sit in some corner with my eyes rolled back moaning as I eat the damn thing. I am intensely anal. I love lists. I love anything that is in order. 
I make lists every day I get up and I make a list of things I'm supposed to do that day, right? I sometimes put on that list things I've done already for the sheer pleasure of crossing them out of my list. I very much like other people's lists. I love the end of the year when the critics compile their lists, their favorite whatever. I compile the same lists myself. Every year I have my favorite movies of that year, my favorite records of that year, and my best friends of that year. I have put together what is officially called Rick Reynolds' Top 20 Friend List for the past 12 years. What I do, and I defy you to try this, it's really hard. I sit down on December 31st of every year and figure out who my friends are, in order of how much I like them. Everybody on that list comes over that night, they bring food, it's a potluck New Year's Eve thing. Then we sit around, we eat, we talk, we listen to music. A few minutes after midnight, people start to gather around me for the real reason we're there. The official reading of Rick's List. <laughs> Every year I start at number 20, a person I like very, very much, just not quite as much as number 19. And I slowly work my way up to my best friend of that year. And I always mention where people had charted the year before so they can watch their progress. <laughs> There's always room for improvement, is what I say. You know, I am so well adjusted, and yet I have so many problems. We don't have time to go into them all tonight. Uh, suffice it to say that I am anal, I'm obsessive, I am vain, overly introspective, lazy, judgmental, insecure, self-righteous. Probably the most annoying thing about me is that I act as though I'm always right about everything. But I make up for that by always being right about everything. <laughs> Please pardon me for noticing this, but I really like a lot of things about me. I am the most honest person I've ever met. It would be bragging if it weren't the truth. I am. I am the most open person I know. I have no secrets. And I mean that literally. Not one secret. And I'm not saying that I have no lurid fantasies or embarrassing faults or painful memories. Of course I do. But I'll tell you the truth. They become so much less lurid, embarrassing, and painful the more I talk about them. Which is basically why we're here tonight. <laughs> I really think at base that I'm a remarkably simple person. Trust me, you know me right now. You have me totally figured out. I am not exaggerating my persona. I am not doing a character, and I am not acting. You paid a lot of money to see a big, kind of Broadway production. Forgive me. All you're going to see tonight is a guy ranting at you. Sometimes it looks like I'm acting. I know that. It looks as though I'm pretending like emotions are overtaking me. I tell you, you know what's happening at those moments? Emotions are overtaking me. These are real things that affect me. There are nights when the show so affects me, it switches into another gear. I call it magical. There are these great, great artistic nights where I dance with the audience, and God, it's great. And I fight back the tears, and I take you on a journey, and it is the most rewarding thing in my life. There are other nights when it does not work. I poke at it, I prod at it, I push as hard as I can, and it doesn't work. And it's always your fault, by the way. <laughs> if the show should not work tonight, and it feels like it will so far, I will not pretend at any point. I will not come to the sad parts and pretend to be sad if I'm not. Because, quite frankly, I wouldn't do it well. You would so see through me, and you wouldn't trust me, and there goes the dynamic of the show. I think that probably the simplest thing about me is how I become happy. Nothing brings me more pleasure than just following my animal instincts. God, I love sex. I love it. I know you love it too. Please trust me. I love it more. I love that moment during sex when I stop being a thinking, rational being and I just become a thrusting beast. I love that. And I love my emotions, the entire gamut, even the negative ones. When somebody cuts me off on the freeway and I'm pissed and fuck you, fuck you! And my brain kind of slithers to the front of my head and I'm so incredibly focused and in that moment and I really enjoy that. <laughs> of course, don't get me wrong, I, I, I prefer my positive emotions. Being in love. You know that. It is the best thing there is by far. I would die for my wife, Lisa. I think. I can't be positive, really. <laughs> How do I know what I do? I'm in an alley, three in the morning, guy's got a gun at Lisa's head. Yeah, I'd like to think I would be noble, okay? Uh, how do I know I wouldn't go, I'm not with her! <sighs> <laughs> 
I do know this, though, for an absolute fact. My favorite moment in life, with no exaggeration, is when I crawl into bed with Lisa at night. I love that. She always goes to bed hours before I do, and her butt is hot by the time I get to bed. <laughs> Am I making this up? It's like a solar device of some sort. <laughs> Soaking up the sun's energy and just radiating all night long. And I slide over next door and I twist her so her back is to me. And I get right into the S position, the spoon thing for some of you. And I have the front of my legs against the back of her legs. My left hand on her right breast and my wiener against her hot butt. <laughs> and I am so happy. That is how I want to die if I could choose. Wouldn't you? I don't want to be in a hospital with tubes up my nose. Just... I want Lisa in my arms and I just drift off. She wakes up the next morning locked in that rigor mortis death grip. <laughs> After cuddling up comes another huge animal bonus. Sleep. Oh, don't you love to sleep? I mean, you know you're an adult when you love naps. <laughs> Middle of the day, TV on in the background, drool dripping. <laughs> Little pool on your pillow there. And as good as sleeping is, let's face it, eating is better. <laughs> I would forego dinner every single day of my life to eat crap all day long. <laughs> One of my favorite moments in life, and I'll, I'll, almost for sure I'll have this tonight, I watch too much TV. We have this big screen TV that my wife hates and I'm up till the wee hours watching some crappy thing on cable. Much like this show. <laughs> I'll be up at three or four in the morning and I've got some nacho cheese Doritos, the, the 269 big bag freshly opened right here. And suddenly, you know, I'll get about halfway through my bag of Doritos and I'll start to feel a little queasy you know, and very guilty because I'm ingesting orange death, basically. <laughs> and suddenly I just go, fuck it, and finish the bag. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you know, it reminds me of a moment I used to have in college. I put off my term papers every single time till the last minute. So I'd be up at three or four in the morning working on some damn thesis, totally confused, completely exhausted. And I'd have this glorious inspiration. I put down my pencil, look up, and go, I'm getting an incomplete. <laughs> it feels so good to give up. <laughs> to surrender, to take the road most traveled. <laughs> but you know what? It feels equally good to persevere, to be strong, to work things out. It really seems in life, and maybe this is naive, but it seems to me we are in a win-win situation. You know what it's like to put your taxes off to the last minute? You've got a Saturday to do your taxes, and instead of doing your taxes, you watch some crappy TV show and take a nap. <laughs> well, it feels great, right? You know what feels better? Doing your taxes. Getting them behind you. I know that I'm getting older. I'm 40 now because it seems like there's a generation behind me and they're screwed up. <laughs> it's all of the body. It's all the easy way. It's all physical. That is not the way to live your life. I know this sounds elitist, but it, damn it is the truth. The smart people I know enjoy life a lot more than the stupid people I know. <laughs> it's true. The smart people I know, of course, are my friends. <laughs> the stupid people I know, of course, are my family. <laughs> ask you this, if you weren't related to your family, would you ever see them again? No. My family as a unit has not created a new memory since the early 70s. We get together every Thanksgiving and dredge up the same stories over and over and over, and they change every year. A lot of historical revisionism in our family. Somehow over the years, my Kafka-esque childhood has become a Frank Capra movie to these people. I noticed something interesting. It took me a while to piece this show together, and I dredged up a lot of memories, ugly and good. And this is interesting to me. Almost all of my childhood memories are summer memories. When I was a kid, June, July, and August lasted much longer than the rest of the year. And for some reason, the most vivid memory I have of my childhood is of a remarkably simple summer day 
in 1966. And I remember quite clearly lying on my bunk. This would be the lower bunk in our, our bedroom in Wood Village, Oregon. And my window was open right by my head. And I could hear a lawnmower way off in the distance. And this warm breeze kind of wafted through the window. God, it was so warm. And the breeze kind of carried that, that, that scent of fresh cut grass. And I could hear my friends up on Maple Street just yelling and screaming. Mom was doing laundry, spin cycle, a little bit of bleach in the air. <laughs> and I'm lying there with the sun on my face. Just so tranquil. And I remember thinking I should go play with my friends. And I wanted to take a nap and I thought I could go watch TV. And the great thing was I did not have to make a decision. It's the beauty of childhood. And you didn't know it when you were a kid. I bet everybody in this room would have traded 12 for 18, would have cashed in that delicious sense of indecision for the responsibility of adulthood. All of my friends, I remember my friends pretending to be adults. They would steal a cigarette or a beer from their folks because these were the icons of adulthood. And they'd crawl behind the wheel of some old junker out behind Gill's garage, and I'd be in the back seat watching them. They'd crack open a beer and take a swig, wash away 10 years of their lives. Light up a cigarette, slide the car into gear, go racing toward adulthood. For what? I mean this, what was the big deal in being an adult? As shitty as my childhood was, it beat what the adults had, and I knew it. <laughs> and my favorite time of the summer were summer nights, after supper and before being called in. And we had this big old side yard. We lived on Birch Street, where it connected up with Maple there. And all the kids would congregate from like 6.30 till 10 or whatever that was. And we played games. Uh, we played kickball in the cul-de-sac. We played prison dodgeball out on the street because it needed to be straighter. Tommy Martin had a tetherball. I never understood the game of tetherball. <laughs> Basically, tall guy wins. Is that it right there? <laughs> My favorite game when I was a kid was played with a red four-square ball. And in Wood Village, the game was called Last Piece of Meat in the World. I think everybody had a version of this game. It had one rule. Catch the guy with the ball, beat the shit out of him. That was it. <laughs> the entire point of the game was to get the ball. You attacked the guy, pounced on him, dogpiled, we called it. Pounded him, beat him, did anything to get the ball. And really, it was ironic you even wanted the ball, you know. <laughs> and I remember this one summer night. Dusk has settled over Wood Village, and all of the kids are gathered in our side yard, and we're playing last piece of meat in the world. And I'm chasing my brother's best friend, Aaron Hagstrom, because he has the ball, and I want it. And I heard our screen door slam, and I heard my mom scream. And I looked over, and I saw Mom, who was about six months pregnant with my sister Candy. And she's wearing this blue terra cloth bathrobe that she wore her entire life. <laughs> and she's running frightened through the yard. And my stepdad, Len, is drunk and he's chasing her. And he caught up to her right where the sidewalk met the street and tackled her right on the concrete and called her a fucking bitch and grabbed her by her hair and dragged her screaming back into the house. And when the door shut, it was like this. Every sound was gone. And I remember being so embarrassed in front of my friends and so terrified for my mom. But I think that the amazing thing about that moment and literally hundreds of moments just like it from my childhood is that they're gone for every member of my family except me. They have disappeared. I think it is remarkable. I have no childhood memories prior to the age of seven. My brother Mike claims to remember the day my dad, my real dad, Jack Reynolds, drowned in the Sandy River. Now, Mike was not even three when that happened. I was just born. I was a baby girl of 21 and we we're out at the sandy river having a picnic and jack is swimming and suddenly he got cramps and he yelled for help and my mom ran out into the water to help him and people held her back because the river was raging and she stood there at the river's edge and actually watched her husband drown and two years later she met len my stepdad who was an alcoholic made our lives miserable for seven years i truly do not have one positive memory of len in fact, I called mom two years ago when we brainstormed, tried to think of one good thing about Len. <laughs> and we thought of one. My sister Candy, who would not exist today if not for Len. God, I have great memories of Candy. Most of them, unfortunately, are of me tormenting her, you know. <laughs> I do remember this one night in Wood Village. Candy was six years old and we're all sitting around the supper table. In the middle of eating, Candy raised a butter knife over her head. 
We all kind of looked at her. <laughs> and very dramatically, she said this as an actual quote. A knife is a knife and a challenge to the death. <laughs> Where in the hell did that come from? I've been looking for that line for 30 years, watching TV every night. It's not there. <laughs> and knives are actually a theme at our house around supper time. I remember once reaching in front of Len for the salt, and he whacked the back of my hand with his steak knife. You know better than to reach in front of people. And he wouldn't let me leave the table, so I took a, a yellow paper towel, and I put it over my hand, and it soaked with blood. And I remember feeling really trapped, and not just trapped at this table. I truly felt trapped in a bizarre childhood. And another night, one of the many ugly fights broke out of the table. And this one grew so intense, and we're sitting there terrified. And finally, Len stood up, and he kicked his chair back. And Mom's terrified, picks up a knife, threw it at him, and it stuck. <laughs> Literally an inch from his head in the wall. And I remember thinking, wow! Mom can throw knives at the dinner table. It didn't seem fair. We weren't even allowed to sing at the dinner table. This, by the way, was an actual rule in our house. No singing at the dinner table. <laughs> Lord knows what kind of an anarchist I might have become without such parental guidance as that. <laughs> I always used to wonder, why do people have children in the first place? Okay, let's be honest. What are children really but little stupid people that don't pay rent? <laughs> Do you need those in your home? And pardon me for being Mr. Negativo. But every time I hold a baby, I have this sneaking suspicion that it would choke me to death for a cookie if it could. Everybody in this room, you are in one of two camps. You either have children, want to have children, love children, think children are the center of the universe, or not. <laughs> I've always been in the or not camp. It's where the selfish people set up housekeeping. I never got kids. I go to my, my friends' houses with kids. It's a nightmare over there. Big hunks of ugly plastic crap everywhere. The smell of poop just kind of clinging there in the air. You try to have a conversation, you get like 30 seconds into it, and the kid is pulling the attention, needs this, that. Also, kids don't laugh at my jokes, which is a little thing to you big thing to me. We live in Petaluma, California. The cutest, sweetest, smartest kids live in Petaluma. Trust me. I will often stop... Well, there's one of them now. I will often stop one of these kids and tell him a joke, juxtapose a couple of ideas to create merriment in their lives. And they always kind of... It's like I'm sucking their brain from their head, you know. Actually, last year, Lisa sat me down to inform me that I am frightening the neighbor children. <laughs> this is not, trust me, one of my goals in life. There's a fine line with kids that I do not see. I will tease a kid, he'll laugh a little. Tease him, he'll laugh a little. Tease him, he'll cry. <laughs> Somewhere between the laughter and the tears is a line you're not supposed to tread over. And I always do. If I had, I don't know, like a seven-year-old son, he would live in a constant state of terror because I don't know where the joke stops. I can imagine tucking my son in bed at night, fluffing up his pillow, giving him a little kiss. Night, son. Night, 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 night. <laughs> I'd shut off his light, pause for a second in his doorway, just a silhouette. <laughs> what is it, Daddy? Oh, never mind. You know, I thought I heard something in your closet. <laughs> That's not good. That is not good. <laughs> you know, I feel sorry for my sister Candy. When she was really little, I was horrible to her in retrospect. Uh, Candy had what I would describe as a neurotic phobia of our vacuum cleaner. We had the big Hoover upright, right? 50 pounds, silver thing, lived in the closet. If Candy saw the vacuum cleaner, and this is every time without exception, she would scream and run terrified from the house crying. And I loved it when that happened. <laughs> and I exacerbated the problem by nicknaming the vacuum cleaner Mr. Hoover. <laughs> and I would very subtly work him into conversations, and it would always freak her out. Candy, that's a pretty dress. Has Mr. Hoover seen that yet? <laughs> 
one night I went way too far with the Hoover joke. I was literally grounded, what was it, two weeks for this, but it was worth it. <laughs> this is about a year after mom had divorced Lynn, and thank God he was gone. Nine o'clock on a school night, I have to put Candy to bed. So I grab her little Hanny. She's very tired, really half asleep. We go down the hall. Oh, she's yawning. Goes over to her room, over to her bed, pulls back her covers. <gasps> There's Mr. Hoover. <laughs> I was an asshole, all right? I went through my adolescence with two characteristics. I was extremely loud and very obnoxious. Which I admit, these are not good things to be as an adult, but they tend to make you popular as a child. I was unbelievably popular in high school, which is a curse. It makes the rest of your life seem boring. I went to Portland State University in 1970 to study philosophy. I felt invisible walking through the halls. Some of you must remember that. It's a horror. And I rebelled by becoming a, a hippie. I became a hippie because it was the thing to become. I grew hair down to my ass. I had a scraggly, miserable beard. But I was a bad hippie. I never protested anything ever. I never got stoned once. I listened to the monkeys, for Christ's sake. After six years of studying philosophy, I graduated from being a loud, obnoxious asshole to being a dark, brooding asshole. <laughs> and I set off for a much, much scarier place than college. The real world. I feel so disconnected so often from the real world, whatever that is. I don't know if you can relate to this at all. I look in the mirror and I hunt for myself in my face and I cannot find me. I know I'm back there. I know I'm in my eyes somewhere. But I can't find... And then I notice from time to time that I'm getting older and my hair is graying, that I have these wrinkles and I can't believe that I'm 40. Now, I'm not saying 40 is old, but you must remember when 40 seemed really old. I remember when 20 seemed really old. Christ, I walk into McDonald's, there are fetuses working behind the counter. <laughs> At the age of 40, my life literally could not be going better, so I'm happy. At the age of 30, the inverse was true. I was so depressed at 30 because I thought when you're 30, you should be there. Wherever you're going in life, this is it. You're an adult. You should be doing that thing. When I was 30, I was living in a hovel downtown Portland trying to write a novel. I was making two, $3,000 a year. I felt like a miserable failure. I had gambled with my life, and I had lost. And during this depressed era of my life, there was a comedy competition that I entered. Scared, scared, scared. Dripping sweat. Bad jokes I had written. I'm up there. And I get off, and I won the competition. Because everybody else in it sucked a little more than I did. <laughs> and when they announced that I was the winner, and I took the stage, the place went crazy and changed my life. I want to be the center of attention. That's what I hate about going to people's houses that have kids, you know. <laughs> I want people to know who I am. I know it's a sickness in our society to lust after fame. I'm sorry. I don't want to die an unknown comedian, which is exactly what would happen if I died tonight. If somebody broke into our house tonight, stabbed me to death, in a couple of days in the paper, you'd see the headline, Comedian Found in Pool of Blood. And I know they call me a comedian because that's what I am. That's all you are in the eyes of the world, the job you perform. You never open a, a headline in, or a newspaper and see a headline like a snappy dresser found in pool of blood. <laughs> you're an occupation with one exception if you're famous. See, if I had done something substantial with my life, if you guys knew who I was, they would print Rick Reynolds found in pool of blood. I like that. Of course, at this point in my career, they'd probably just print Man Stains Carpet. That's not enough. Actually, in a lot of ways, I see my desire for fame as, as my bid for immortality. I fear death. It's a spooky notion that I'm not going to be here someday. Everybody in this room knows they're going to die, and it's really obvious. You know what? Not one person in this room feels they're going to die. You cannot wrap your brain around that fact. You just can't get there. Now, I am so obsessed with death. You ever watch movies from the 30s and think to yourself, geez, 
Everybody in this movie is dead now. I watch movies from the 70s and I think, geez, all of the dogs in this movie are dead now. I think it's really weird that we're all going to die. And everybody in this room deals with it somehow. Somehow or other, you reach beyond your death. I do it with my career. You know what I want from life? I want to leave behind me a body of work that might affect somebody's life past my own. That is what I want. And it's what my wife wants. My wife wants children. She wants to imbue her sense of herself into her kids and know she's leaving some essential ingredient of herself for posterity. Now, a lot of people seek their immortality through their religion. In our society, if you believe in God, your body may pass, but your spirit, the essence of you, ascends into the heavens where it dwells for eternity. God, that's a neat program. I wish I could sign up, but I can't. The person I am, this thing in here, could never make that leap of faith. And I was eight years old when I first realized that. You know, I was sitting in the basement of the Wood Village Baptist Church when our Sunday school teacher said the most bizarre thing. She said, and then Jesus changed the water into wine. I thought about it a minute, and I raised my hand and said, How? And she said, well, Ricky, you know, it's like creation. God can do anything. It's called a miracle. And you have to believe that to get to heaven. I couldn't believe it. The harder I thought about it, I couldn't even believe that other people believed it. <laughs> what I believed when I was eight is what I continue to believe today, science. I think things are somehow explainable. Will you show me any kind of scientific principle that even comes close to explaining the changing of water into wine? Some sort of chardonization process or other. <laughs> now, religion had a much, much bigger strike against it when I was a kid. My brother, Mike. Mike is crazy. I mean, certifiably one of these crazy guys with the Bible. He believes that all Jewish people will burn in hell. He does. He believes that women belong in the home. He believes that homosexuality is a disease. Yeah. Mike's the kind of guy that has to talk to God because nobody else can stand him. <laughs> Things came to a head between Mike and me, when was this, like three years ago, Thanksgiving. We're sitting around mom's table, the turkey's there, everything's growing cold as Mike prays over it. Eight heads are bowed, I'm staring out the back window at uh, mom's bird feeder. And there's a silver thaw, so the birds are trying to peck through to get to the sea. And I'm riveted on it. And Mike keeps glancing at me, very annoyed, because I'm breaking the prayer chain. And I'm totally oblivious. I'm in my own world. I'm thinking... Do birds talk to each other? Do they get cold? I'm thinking bird things at this point. <laughs> and Mike shocked me at the end of the prayer. He just loses it. You know, Ricky, I'm really getting annoyed with you. You know what I'm starting to think? And I mean this too. I'm starting to think that you're not going to go to heaven. And I lean toward him very calmly. I go, Mike, I don't want to go to heaven. You know why? You're going to be there. <laughs> It's so exasperating. You must know this feeling. You ever been awakened early in the morning by a Jehovah's Witness? <laughs> you're walking downtown, you're accosted by a crazy street preacher with a megaphone. You turn on the TV, there's Tammy Baker, Jerry Falwell, that Reverend Scott guy that never sleeps. <laughs> Has it ever dawned on you that heaven might be a very annoying place? I'll tell you, my big fear in life is that I have a son who, as a teenager, rebels against me by becoming devoutly religious. <laughs> Nothing would bother me more. I picture myself pounding on his door at night. You're not praying in there, are you, son? <laughs> uh, no, Daddy, I'm masturbating. Well, good for you. <laughs> there are 600 people in this room right now. Somebody must be offended by this time. Uh, let me say something in all sincerity. If you believe in God, if you're spiritual, and I bet most of you are, most people in the country are, I do, I envy you that aspect of your life. Please trust me, I looked really, really hard for the answers to life. I could not find them. And you could. You know, you know where you came from. You know where you're going. You know why you're here. I think you're wrong. <laughs> But I do envy you the conviction. And you know what? I have something like religious convictions. I studied religion for years. I've read the Bible. You know, I'm not the Antichrist. The Bible is a beautiful book. If you follow the precepts and the philosophies in this book, your life will be so enriched. 
I just don't think it's the truth. It's also very hard to read. Horrible character development in the Bible. <laughs> Look at your New Testament. The main character, Jesus, first appears as a baby. The very next scene he's in with lines, he is suddenly an adult delivering sermons. Well, you've got to ask yourself, what happened to teen Jesus? Where is that? <laughs> I have a theory. I think they avoided this part of his life because he was a problem kid. <laughs> He's got to be a little spoiled. Imagine you were 13 years old, okay? You show up at the father-son picnic <laughs> with God. <laughs> You're going to win every event you enter. <laughs> and nobody can eat more pie than God. Don't bother trying. <laughs> I'm actually drawn to a lot of religions a lot of Eastern religions, Judaism, because they tend to emphasize taking who you are and bettering it for no reward whatsoever. Western religions are all very reward-oriented. Of Western religions, my favorite is Catholicism because it's so bizarre. <laughs> well, the further you dig in the Catholic doctrine, the more things like exorcism become reasonable to you. <laughs> it is somewhat ironic that my two favorite things in any religion are both in the Catholic Church confession and the Pope. I love the Pope, which doesn't say a lot. I mean, everybody likes the Pope. Nobody ever says that fucking Pope. <laughs> Pointy headed bastard. You never get that. You know, I saw the Pope in San Francisco four years ago. I was so jacked. I was so excited. The Pope is here. I'm on Geary Boulevard. 120,000 people could not have been more disappointed. You're waiting, you're waiting, you're waiting. He zips by in a box. What is that? <laughs> he is literally, he's in this Pope phone booth thing. You know what might have impressed me a little bit? Fill the booth with water. Okay? Tie the Pope's hands behind his back. Hey, give him like a mile to work his way out. Let him show off a little bit. Now, I hesitate in doing this on television because it is so offensive. You be the judge. Tell me if this bit is offensive to you. I might have become a Catholic if the church was a little hipper. Like if at communion the host was fudge, I'd be there for that. <laughs> okay, what if I added body of Christ with or without nuts? Is that too much? <laughs> I am, no. Let me tell you something. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> body of Christ with or without nuts is the funniest thing I have ever said in my life. <laughs> And there have been nights I've been so pissed when I would offer up my favorite joke, this pearl of humor, and nobody laughs. And I stare at you like you're idiots. This is so funny. I think I mentioned this before. I am right about everything. I am. Aren't you? Don't you feel self-righteously convicted about everything you think? Of course you do. You have to if you're human. Let's take the most volatile issue in the country today, abortion. Wherever you stand on abortion, I guarantee you, you will never change your mind. You feel so volatilely self-righteous on this issue. Could you be wrong, though? Can you step back and look at the other side? It is so hard. I try. I go, Rick, there are two sides to everything. On one side of the abortion issue, there are people that believe that a woman has the right to decide what happens to her own body. On the other side of the abortion issue, there are brain-dead zealots. <laughs> who's to say who's right? <laughs> if far be it from me to judge. I'll tell you, as I get older, I'm getting more and more narrow about everything. Oh, they're fucked. They're screwed. It's just me that's right. My wife and I are the only sane people on the planet, and I have my doubts about her, to tell you the truth. That's why my friends are my friends. They agree with me about almost everything. Our one point of contention, that the place where we have conflict, is, uh, for lack of, a, uh, of another term, metaphysically. I have very religious friends. I have spirit. My wife, God love her is into this whole, what is it, honey, karma. Fuck karma. It does not work. You can give good, give good, give good, get run over by a truck. There is no karma. Actually, Lisa's, one of Lisa's best friends, Jeff, 
a redheaded, really devout Christian visited us recently, and I love Jeff. He's a great guy, and he's praying for me. And he always says, Jesus is going to get you. Like I need Jesus guard now or something to hold him on. <laughs> I remember the first time it dawned on Jeff I didn't believe in God, and it was so incredible to him. And we were sitting in front of our fireplace on these rocking chairs, just squeezing all we could out of this night, and talking and growing tired. And he looks at me with this sudden realization in his eyes and goes, Rick, you're an atheist, aren't you? Geez, that's weird. You seem like a nice person. I'm confused about your code of ethics, though, Rick. How do you know what right and wrong are without God? You just, what, do you make that up, kind of? Everybody have a different right and wrong? No, Jeff. Everybody has the exact same right and wrong. They are objective things in the world. You do not need a religion to teach you ethics. Thou shalt not kill. Duh! <laughs> Does anybody ever flip through this book going, Jeez, I want to fuck my neighbor's wife. Don't know if I should. <laughs> if you can't intuit certain things, you are beyond redemption at this point. <laughs> and I'll tell you what the drawback is to thinking that everybody knows what right is. You watch them do the wrong thing, and you just grow to hate people. I'm consumed with hatred. I am. I sit in movie theaters. Does it bother anybody here, loud talkers in movie theaters? I'm, I can't even go to movies. I just sit there going, God damn it, who's going to talk? I'm just like, oh. If I had the power to stare at the back of somebody's head, blink and blow their head up, I would use it. It is beyond my ken in this day and age that people continue to litter. Now, I am not on a soapbox. I'm not better than anybody in this room. Nobody hears litters. I know you don't. I look at you. I know you don't. You're done with your Snickers wrapper. Hey, it's a hassle, but you're not going to throw it on the street. Most of the people in this country could throw it on the street. By the way, you know what I think the fine for littering should be? And I mean this. Whatever you litter, get shoved up your butt. <laughs> It's a two-liter Coke bottle, for Christ's sake. Cops should carry rubber gloves and Vaseline at all times. Came out of the vehicle, it's going back in. <laughs> Have you ever been with somebody you really liked and you actually watched them litter in front of you? It is unbelievable. This happened to me, it's got to be three years ago now. Driving down the street, I'm driving in my little MR2 with my 17th best friend, Kevin. <laughs> He takes the last bite of a banana, rolls down the window, throws the peel out. I'm like... And then he bullshit rationalized. You know what he said to me? Biodegraded. <laughs> Here is yet another trite thing from my show. Everything on this planet is biodegradable in some amount of time. You can throw plutonium out your car window, <laughs> drive back a million years later, hey, it's gone! <laughs> If you think about it, the human body is extremely biodegradable. I don't think that means we should have funeral services out along the highway now. <laughs> Procession rolling along about 60, the pallbearers heave the body out. <laughs> Five months later, it's flat and dry with a little tuft of hair sticking out. <laughs> That's not a proper memorial. Here's an odd thing. I think not just about me, but about people. I get pissed over the little inequities. I don't over the big ones. I don't. I don't. Open up your newspaper. It's a testament of man's inhumanity to man. I stare at these things in awe. Well, you look at the Holocaust. If, you had, if the Holocaust had not have happened and you made it up, people would say, unbelievable. No way. This could never happen. And yet it did. It's, it's unthinkable. That's the word. Now, I don't need to go very far for these sorts of things. I go to my own family and I'm in awe of the way my mother has been treated her entire life by men. I think it's very ironic that as horrible as my stepdad Len was to my mom, when he left, she missed him. And this void formed in her life that she filled with alcohol. She drank for years. And she hung out in these bars in our area and she brought men home from these bars who were unbelievably cruel to her and my mother was never anything but nice to these guys and I look at my brother Mike today I know why Mike is Mike it's so obvious in the 50s and 60s there were really strong moral implications to your mom sleeping with men she wasn't married to 
And when that happened with some frequency in your home, it got you. It got me. I have my demons. I have worked them out. But my brother has not. You know what I'm left with? I'm left with real strong memories of the arguments of lying in bed, listening to my mother and some man fighting. And I, I would lie in my bed and I could hear the TV muffled out past my bedroom door. Then their voices would start. And they'd get louder and louder and more and more ugly. And I'd wait for the fight to climax somehow. And he would hit her or he would smash a beer bottle through a window or something. And I'd pull the covers over my head and I'd whisper over and over again, leave her alone, go away, leave her alone. And I remember one night, a man that I never met going through our kitchen cupboards, breaking everything, shattering every dish and every glass and screaming at my mom. My mom is crying uncontrollably in the front room. And my brother is crying in the bunk above mine. And I'm crying all night. And I could not imagine the next day coming. I just couldn't. To walk through that door again seemed impossible. I think that the amazing thing about my mother, and I do think my mother is an amazing person, is her sense of humor. I'm sure it's what saved her. I think that the tragedy of my mom's life is that all she ever wanted in life was to be happy. And even as a little kid, I watched her look for that in all the wrong places. Now, I love my mom. I love her a lot. I believe she knows that, though I cannot tell her. Nobody told me they loved me when I was little, ever. Nobody held me. There was no affection. But that's not why I can't tell my mom. It's because we never talked. I don't think anything is more damaging than not being able to talk about what you're thinking about. That's why I'm doing this show, for Christ's sakes. Now, I, I loved Mom when I was a kid because she was my mother, but I was so terrified of her. Uh, she was a manic depressive, and she would snap over little things, and she beat my brother Mike and me severely for years until she started getting treatments. And today she is still a manic depressive, though she is on medication. She takes these pills every day that keep her stabilized. God, I used to have such a fear that I would one day be on this medication because I've never known where to look for happiness myself. In fact, I think that if you ask anybody who knows me really well, and there are, you know, at least 20 of those people around, <laughs> they would tell you that I'm really, I think I'm doing remarkably well now because I met my wife, what was it, 10 years ago. You know, this is kind of a Biscalia-esque thing to say, but let me say it. <laughs> I don't believe in God, but I do believe in love. I think that love is something much more than sex and affection and just being with somebody. It's some magical thing that I believe in. And I know how sweet this sounds. Don't be embarrassed. I am generally a dark, morose son of a bitch. <laughs> but without romantic love, my life would have never been worthwhile. And I'm not now saying that I have... The perfect relationship. Lisa and I have a rock-solid, great relationship, but we argue all the time. We had a fight three weeks ago. Unbelievable how pissed I got. You ever do this, by the way? You ever been in the middle of one of those really intense fights? You were absolutely livid when it slowly starts to dawn on you that you're wrong. <laughs> I hate that. And the weird thing is you don't stop arguing. <laughs> You've got what I call dickhead momentum built up. You're on this downhill slide and you can't stop yourself. I mean, I told you to get a half a dozen shit. Look at this, you only got six. This house is a mess. We had a fight. God, this pissed me off. I am lying in bed about to fall asleep, minding my own business, loving husband. Lisa actually had the nerve to tell me that she would rather have me go blind, yeah, than have her brother die. Okay, okay, maybe it was a stupid question. Everybody in this room knows a couple that shouldn't be together. They just argue constantly. By the way, if you don't know that couple, you are that couple. 
I believe that the primary motivating factor in all of life is inertia. It is extremely difficult to stop moving in the direction you're headed. I mean, how many people here have a job? You never thought this would be your career. You were just going to do it for a while, and then slowly it's what you became. You can do that very easily with relationships as well. Do you think you've met the perfect person for you in life? No way. You met a person at a place that you happen to be at the same time and you ask them out and you had sex and you fell in love and you live together now if it works good if it doesn't it ruins your life don't you know people they wake up every day married to the worst roommate of all time somebody who's ruining their life and i know that counseling can be effective sometimes yes but you know what's always effective divorce <laughs> divorce is like ripping a, a band-aid off a really hairy part of your body just yank it, just yank it once, scream, and go on with your lungs. It's better than pulling a hair a day for the rest of your life. To me, the ironic thing about divorce in our society is that compared to the marriage, it's a small thing. Well, they're of equal import. They should be equal. There should be a divorce ceremony of some sort paid for by the husband's parents. That's only fair. That's only fair. They would send out the invitations. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Reynolds are embarrassed to announce the divorce of their idiot son, Rick, from that bitch, Lisa. Something like that. You'd go back to the exact same church, walk backwards down the aisle. You'd pull off the ring, give it to the worst man. You'd have your maids of dishonor, sluts in black over there. Make it more embarrassing is my point. Now, I know people that fight over the stupidest things. Well, one thing, I do not understand jealousy over your partner's sexual past. What does that have to do with you? I know that my wife, Lisa, had sex before she met me, okay? I can handle that. Of course, she didn't enjoy it. <laughs> really don't think so. I am 40 years old. I've had sex with 23 women in my life. Now, some of you are thinking, wow. Others are thinking, geez, what a wiener. <laughs> 23 women. I've had crabs twice, which is not a bad woman to crab ratio. <laughs> go with those figures. <laughs> you know, one of the things we do talk about a lot at our house when friends come over, sex. It's a neat subject. I'm always amused to discover that all women think they know how horny men are. You're not even close. <laughs> I would have had sex with as many women as I could have in my life if I could have, if they would have let me. I did not have the pre prerequisites of catching women. I was not cool and I was not handsome. I know I'm not an ugly person. I'm not going to kiss you and have you vomit all over the place. From me. <laughs> I could have been good looking though. You know, good looks was ripped from me. It pisses me off. When I was in the second grade, I could not see the blackboard. So I had to get these, the ugliest, geekiest glasses known to man. And I had these glasses until high school when I got contacts, but I also got acne, really bad acne in high school. And I had horrible acne for years. As my acne started to go away, so did my hair. I never had one good year. When I started losing my hair, unbelievable. Uh, you, did it bother you when you started losing your hair? No lying bastard, of course it did! It's the worst, I'm looking in the mirror, I'm losing my hair, I can't stand it! So I started getting my transplants. My hair now grows on top of my head, in rows like a field of corn. I'm not losing my hair, it's being picked clean by crows at this point. I just got my hair transplants, my first hair transplants, when I met Lisa. Oh, God, she was so cute. She was so young, 21, I can't believe. She's waitressing at this comedy club, right? And I work up my nerve, and I, I ask her out, and I had my plug, so I was so worried. I was actually talking to her, kind of like this, kind of leaning back. Right now. I fell in love with Lisa in, um, I'd say, about two weeks. She fell in love with me in about six months, and... Uh, we got married six months after that and moved to Los Angeles. That's where you go if you want to be famous, right? Lisa hates L.A. because she's normal. Right? <laughs> but we lived there for five years because 
damn it, I just wanted fame. What eventually drove me out of Los Angeles was the entertainment industry. I don't want to say anything bad about the entertainment industry, but it is an ugly cancer that can consume you. <laughs> and it certainly did me. God, I remember it was like three years ago. Three years ago, I sat down at 1.15 in the morning to watch one of my best friends, Jake, do his debut on The Letterman Show. I would have never admitted to myself that I wanted Jake to do badly. But that's what I wanted. And he came out on that stage and killed like I've seen nobody kill before or since. And I went to bed massively depressed. And I woke up the next day and I asked myself, what kind of a world is it you live in where your friend's successes are somehow your failures? Well, it's a really sick world, isn't it? And it's one of many reasons that I moved. And we bought this house in Petaluma. I can't get over how much I love my house. I also can't get over how much my wife, Lisa, loves the garden in our backyard. It's dirt and shit that will be dead soon. <laughs> and she's consumed with the thing. I'm always hurting her feelings. We'll be sitting around the supper table and Lisa will say, Ricky, how's that tomato? And I kind of look up and go, hey, save this a quarter. Good deal. And I go, hey. <laughs> About two years ago, I finally got the zen of Lisa's garden. I was sitting one night, watching TV, my big screen TV, eating my Mystic Mints, which I love. And generally, when I eat cookies, I try to save the last one for special. So this one night, I went to reach for the last cookie. Shit! And it was gone. And to show you what a wretched husband I am, my first thought was that Lisa took the last cookie. And then I remembered, God damn it. I had eaten the last cookie without even realizing it was the last cookie, so I never got that last cookie enjoyment. <laughs> and that's when I began to formulate my very simplistic, really gooberistic philosophy of life. You should eat every cookie as though it were the last cookie. <laughs> and when I thought that simplistic thing, I got a lot more than Lisa's garden. I finally got Lisa. What Lisa has done is what you have to do to be happy. She's taken an insignificant thing on this planet and made it a big deal in her life. That is something I had never done. In fact, I don't even think, in a sense, I lived my life. I observed it. I was always doing this pseudo-intellectual thing where I was going to piece together the tapestry of my life. Well, that's bullshit. There is no tapestry of my life. All that ever exists at any point are the moments that weave my tapestry. And the more I live in my moments, trust me, the happier I become. I'll give you a good example of this. You know those few extra minutes of sleep you give yourself in the morning? Those few toasty, luxurious minutes are worth more than your entire eight hours of sleep, really, because you're so riveted by them. Don't you lay there in the morning going, ten more minutes! Oh, God, I'm happy! Ten minutes, I can't believe it! Ten minutes, it's a long time. Oh, God. Nine minutes, all good, nine. You take those ten minutes, you stretch them into an hour by paying attention to them. You know, look at this year. Look how much of this year has gone by already. And we just had a New Year's, didn't we, recently? And they always say this, the older you get, the faster time goes by. Well, it's obvious why that is. Because the stimuli in your life diminishes. You've seen it all before. You're doing shit you do over and over again. That's why you have to step outside and go, hey, this is a great thing in my life. And while I have your attention, let me ask you this question. I love this question. Somebody hands you a magic coin and you flip it. If it lands heads, you'll get everything in life you've ever wanted. You'll be rich, you'll be famous, play the piano, anything. If it lands tails, you die. You instantly and painlessly pass from existence. And the question is simple. Would you take that chance with your life? Would you flip that coin? I think that if you would, if you deep down in your heart think you would flip the coin, you got big problems. <laughs> the only life you will ever have is not enough for you. Nothing could be more tragic than that. And I should know, because it was my lot for 37 years. I would have flipped the coin like that for the first 37 years of my life because I didn't like what I had. 
And three years ago, I made a very conscious decision to not flip the coin. I said to myself, I am not going to be the things I thought I would be. I'm not going to wait until they happen. I'm not going to cure AIDS. I'm not going to win a Nobel Peace Prize. This is what I have. It had better be enough. And we moved to Petaluma, and a week went by, and a month went by, an entire year went by in which I was not suicidally depressed. I like that. <laughs> you know, I used to play this game in college all the time. I would turn off the pilot light on my stove, and I'd turn on all the gas, and I'd lie down on my bed. I would not permit myself to get up until I could think of one good reason to go on living. If I did this today, I'd just say fudge and get back up, right? <laughs> well, this is college, and I'm, I'm sophomoric and naive, and one night, I couldn't think of a reason. And I fell asleep, and I fell unconscious, and hours went by. And some people smelled the gas, and they busted down the door, and they busted the window, and they're pumping on my chest. And as I came out of the thing choking and hacking, the first thing I felt was embarrassment, because, you know, this looks bad. <laughs> and the next thing I felt was fear, this fear I've had my entire life that I would one day turn out like my mother. Because I remember this day, years before this, when I walked into the Gresham Hospital lobby to pick Mama, and she's sitting in this corner, very pale. She's reading a Life magazine. And I walked right up to her and I said, Mom, you ready to go? Mom? Mom, are you ready? She puts down her magazine and she looks right at me. And I can tell she has no idea who I am. And the receptionist saw this happen and she called me over. Excuse me, Mr. Reynolds? Mr. Reynolds, I think you're supposed to talk to the doctor before you take your mom home. So I went into this doctor's office and this bearded doctor proceeded to tell me about electroshock therapy, about how it was painless, how bits and pieces of mom's memory would come back that night or that year, and other memories somehow would be erased forever. And I used to try really hard on the nights of mom's shock treatments to convince her that she had borrowed money from me. <laughs> I know that sounds horribly mean. This would have been much meaner to do years before, because years before, we didn't have any money. We were very poor. Welfare and food stamps, all of that. But when this happened, when I was 16 years old, things were going pretty well because after all of the crap that my mom had lived through, she had finally met a decent man. His name was Don, Donald Chase, dad number three. I remember very clearly the first moment I saw Don. I was 12 years old. And I got up one morning and there was a man sleeping on our couch with his jacket over him and I kind of tiptoed by him and I sat down at our red dinette set and I got my raisin bran and I'm eating it Don woke up, started talking to me right off the bat. First thing he said, you must be Ricky, in a very pleasant voice. Mike got up and he was nice to Mike. He was nice to Candy. Most bizarre of all, he was really nice to my mom. I had never in my life seen a man be nice to my mother before. They used to stand in the middle of our kitchen and kiss what I called movie kisses. Really long kisses. He'd lean her back for like a minute. If I had known tongues were involved, I would have barfed at the time. <laughs> and Don started to hang out in our house, and I started to think of him as our salvation, in a way, as my escape from this bizarre childhood and mom's long overdue chance for happiness. And he slept on the couch for a couple of weeks. And I got up in this one morning, and he wasn't on the couch, and I so panicked till I saw his car out front. It was a two-tone green 55 Ford, the car I learned to drive on. And I figured it out. They are sleeping together now. But I, I wasn't embarrassed. I wasn't ashamed like I had been with the other guys because Don was nothing like the other guys. And the happiest day of my life by far was the day they sat us down to tell us they were getting married. It was so tremendous. I remember just bursting because this is what I wanted. I wanted to be like other people. You know, it is very embarrassing to be poor. It's re I hated using our food stamps. I hated that kids made fun of me at school because of the way I smelled. And we, I was, we were the welfare family. And that's the whole thing. A care package would come at Christmas. And it was so embarrassing. But all of that turned around when Don got a really good job at the aluminum plant in Troutdale. And he had a house built for us out in Fairview. I used to ride my Stingray bike out every day. And I'd walk through the framework of this house. I could not believe we would live there one day. And I go up to my bedroom, sawdust flying all around. I got to go through this color chart, choose any color I wanted for my room. I chose royal blue. My brother Mike chose glow green for his. 
When we moved in, it was like Christmas times 10. It was so great. Don built me this bed that my mom still has. It has drawers underneath, you know. I remember this one Saturday lying on my new bed, listening to Don mow our new lawn out back. And suddenly the lawnmower died. And Don started screaming my name, Ricky! Ricky! And I ran downstairs in a panic, and Mom was jumping up off the sofa, and we looked at each other and rushed out into the garage, and Don was standing there holding one of his fingers in this hand. And we rushed him to the hospital, and they sewed it back on, and it worked. It grew back, short and crooked, but it was okay. And I was so proud that week because everybody had been home. Saturday, my older brother Mike is in his glow green room upstairs. My mother, an adult, was downstairs, but when Don had needed help, he had thought to call out to me, to Ricky. It still makes me proud. And my mom, God, she blossomed. When we moved into that house, she was so happy, the happiest I'd ever seen her before or since. In fact, I think as a family, we were incredibly happy until Don started robbing banks. <laughs> He held up two savings and loans and a Kmart before he was caught. It turned out he was a compulsive gambler. Had a prison record my mother did not know about. He maxed out the Visa MasterCard, he went through the savings, he wrote bad checks, and he left my mom with a lot of bills and three kids, and he went back to prison and my mom divorced him and we never saw him again. Candy was the only one to stay in touch. He had adopted Candy years before and they were close. When Don went back to prison, I moved out of the house. I felt that I escaped. I had to. My mother sank lower than I could stand. And it was an emotional vacuum to be with her. And she hated Don now. We were not allowed to mention Don's name in her presence. Nine years went by before Mom ever discussed Don with me. And she called me one night in the middle of the week, and I knew the instant I heard her voice that something was wrong. And she told me over the phone that she had just heard from my sister Candy that Don had died of cancer in a halfway house in Portland. And she started crying over the phone. And it was the saddest moment in my life. And I do feel a great deal of shame today because I've told everybody that my big fear in life is that I turn out like my mother. I tell you the truth, I look at myself today and I realize that most of my best traits came from my mother. My sense of humor, it's so obvious. It's why I live life the way I do. Everything, every emotion comes to me way too strongly and way too quick, quickly. I cry more easily than anybody I know. Long distance phone commercials, I'm like, oh God, no. <laughs> My latest thing, if I see elderly men eating by themselves in restaurants, I always tear up. It's gotten to the point that Lisa will say, Ricky, don't turn around. <laughs> And I know I'm projecting myself into these guys. I think that this guy, who was so in love with this woman for 40 or 50 years, is alone now. And will go home alone, and will sleep alone, and will wake up the next morning and just for an instant think his wife is beside him. And it is so sad to me. And that's why I do what my mom would have done. That's why I make fun of this guy now. It is my defense mechanism, my sick sense of humor. I remember years ago walking through the Embarcadero section here in San Francisco with a friend. And we noticed this guy in front of us. Very nice guy in a nice suit on, a briefcase in this hand. This hand was gone, missing, replaced with one of those hook things. And I started making fun of the guy because I felt bad for him. I said, look at Captain Hook going to work. Obviously, I would never make these jokes loudly enough for him to hear me. I would never hurt this guy's feelings or, you know, risk getting a hook in the side of the head. <laughs> When you see a guy with a hook, you have to feel bad for him somehow. I see a guy and I, I go, who would put a hook at the end of their arm? How many times a day do you have an actual use for a big hook? <laughs> if I lost my hand, I'd replace it with the key to my house before a big hook. <laughs> I'd have a toothbrush sticking out of my sleeve. Make it detachable. Now it's a flashlight, a dustbuster, something. <laughs> years old, I've never in my life said, honey, where's the big hook? <laughs> you know, you need the hook, you can never find it. <laughs> Today, big hook jokes epitomize my sense of humor. 
I know it's not for all taste. It's like body of Christ with or without nuts, okay? <laughs> it is potentially offensive to a lot of people. That's the secret of its charm. I read an article years ago in the Village Voice where a writer suggested that everybody in the world, without exception, was either a creep or an asshole. That is the truth. You are either a creep or an asshole. Do you know what you are? I am an asshole. I know that. My wife, Lisa, whom I love very much, is a creep. If you're not positive what you are, you're a creep, let me tell you. Assholes know they're assholes. They're actually proud of you. Let me tell you a joke. The way you naturally respond to this joke will tell you whether you're a creep or an asshole. This is guaranteed to work unless you've heard the joke before. Which you may have. It's the only thing in the show I didn't write. God, I love this joke. I first heard it when I was 10, and I still love it. There's a man pacing in the waiting room of a hospital, waiting for his wife to deliver their next child. They've had a number of children up to this point, but they've all been horribly deformed. Do you like it so far? It gets better, really. Eventually, the doctor walks in, look of consternation on his face. <laughs> Mr. Smith, would you love your baby? Oh, say, I don't know, say, uh, if it had no arms or legs. Oh, my God. Yes, I would. Just take me to my wife and baby. Well, brace yourself and follow me. So he leads him down this corridor, through this long hallway, into the delivery room. There's his wife in bed, big bundle in her arms. He kind of tiptoes over. Peels back the blanket. <gasps> There's a giant 10-pound eyeball. The guy goes, oh, my God, what could be worse? The doctor looks at him and says, he's blind. <laughs> okay? If you burst out laughing at that joke, you're an asshole. <laughs> if you did what my wife would have done, kind of smiled, but inwardly went, mm, you're a creep. There is no value judgment here. It is not better to be a creep or an asshole. You were born one of these two things, you'll die the same thing. Look at your friends. Isn't it obvious who the creeps and assholes are? Some people are elusive. My brother, Mr. Religion, huge asshole. Mike laughs at the sickest things in life. The hardest I've ever seen my brother Mike laugh was at a newscaster in Portland, Oregon, who had a speech impediment. Why he became a newscaster, I don't know, really. What he used to do, though, is switch up his THs and his Ss, had a sibilant problem. And the writers must have known that, because they gave him an awful lot of them in his story. <laughs> One night, for the life of this guy, he could not get through this story, and we were dying. Mike was on his back, twitching as though electricity's going through. I'm down on one knee, about to pass out, and I glance at the screen, and this guy's going, Theopolitita, like that. God, it was funny. Five minutes later, we're still laughing. Mike's on his feet trying to say something to me. You know, Ricky? <laughs> and finally, he wiped his eyes. He looked right at me and said, You know, Ricky, only the truth is funny. Whoa. <laughs> I was 10 years old when Mike said that to me, and it seemed like pure genius. And about three years ago, I was sitting in front of my computer, one miserably hot... Los Angeles afternoon, working on my stand-up comedy act. And I had grown so bored with stand-up comedy by this time, and specifically with my act. <laughs> and I got to daydreaming, and for some reason I thought of this thing that my crazy brother Mike had said to me nearly 30 years before. Only the truth is funny. And I think it's obvious that that is not literally true. Look at the far side. But I think the far side is so hysterical because it does something with the truth. It takes the truth into account, which I had never done in my act. And I decided, what would happen? What would happen if I took the lies out of my act? All of the, uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the club. Oh, I just broke up with my girlfriend. And so I took everything not true out of my act, and I had no act. I had nothing left. <laughs> the hardest bit for me to let go of was this thing I loved about my grandfather, who was paralyzed from the neck up. You know, he was, and it's tragic, but he was a lounge singer at the time. If you think about it, who's going to pay good money to see... funny 
I thought, really. So, for some reason, after nine years of being funny every night, trying to make drunk people burst out laughing in bars, it wasn't fun anymore. It didn't seem important. I don't know, I lost the magic of it. So I gave it up and we moved to Petaluma. And I started to piece together the puzzle of my life, which became this show. And I started to acquire what I naively call the ingredients of happiness. Living in the moment, appreciating the little things in my life, being in love with somebody who loved me back and trying to be my notion of a good person. And these things made me happier, but not happy enough. I still had a very Peggy Lee-esque sensation. <laughs> Have you never looked at your life and asked, is that all there is? I mean, it seems a little thin sometimes, doesn't it? And then two years ago, I got the call. The call I had dreaded my entire life. My wife is at her doctor's, and she's calling to tell me that she's pregnant. Are you sure? <laughs> well, yeah, I think it's a good thing, honey. I'm just I'm trying to get used to it. Of course I'm happy. Hope it's a girl. Hope she looks just like you. Come on home, honey. We've got to celebrate. This is great. Good news. Real good news. Bye-bye. Fuck! <laughs> We're going to have a baby, a crying, pooping shackle around our ankles the rest of our lives. I don't want that kind of responsibility. I don't want to be a father. I do not have a father I can look up to and emulate. I did not have a good childhood. I don't even like children. This is a mistake. And I'll tell you, I made a lot of mistakes during Lisa's pregnancy. The biggest was the day I told her I didn't need to be with her in the delivery room. Politically, a very bad move. <laughs> she shot me one of those looks of death, and I went, Kidding! <laughs> we started taking Lamaz class. I hated Lamaz with such a passion because it was disgustingly cute. The first night, all of the men had to stand up and give a speech about why they were there. And I'm ready to bolt at any second. I can't stand this. And finally, they come to me, Mr. Reynolds, why are you here tonight? So I stand up and I go, I'm here tonight to help my beautiful wife, Lisa, and to share in this glorious moment. <laughs> and I'll tell you the truth, I didn't think it would be a glorious moment. I thought it would be like a car accident. <laughs> you, you ever been in a, a pretty bad car accident? You get out and you hover above the reality of that humongous moment? I thought it would be that. I thought Lisa would be in a great deal of pain, and I did not want to be there. Well... On January 6th of last year, three weeks before Cooper was due, way before we were ready for him, we're sitting watching TV one afternoon. Lisa gets up very nonchalantly, goes into the bathroom. She comes back and she says, there's water coming out of me. <laughs> so I looked at her and said, pee? I'm an idiot, but I thought when your water broke, it was obvious, it just came out. No, it's trickling, she tells me. So I call the doctor, it's trickling, I tell him. And he says, that's very common, keep us surprised. So every hour on the hour for the next four hours, I called and I said, trickling, trickle, 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 trickle. And he says, this is it, you're having your baby come to the hospital. So I went to the hospital that day, Sunday. Cooper was born on Tuesday. It was not the perfect birth that we had hoped for. After 24 hours of being there, the water had in fact broken, but there was no labor. So they had to hook Lisa up to an IV of this Pitocin stuff. For the next 12 hours or so, we trudge up and down this long corridor. Lisa's pushing her IV. I'm walking beside her eating these vanilla puddings. 12 of them I had, they're in the fridge. Take them, they're free. 12 vanilla puddings and they never appeared on the bill. To me, that's the miracle of birth right there. <laughs> Eating, they're delicious. Well, when labor finally kicked in, I understood why we had taken Lamaze class. Pain, a great deal of pain. I hated this pain because it was happening to my wife and because it was a mystery to me. I could not relate to it. It's an intense woman cramping thing. It would have been so much easier on me if I understood the pain. If every 30 seconds somebody had snuck in the room and whacked her in the head with a big stick, that would be better.
breathe, honey, breathe. Here comes that damn stick. Whack, whack, whack. Damn, that must hurt. Come on, breathe again. You can do it. Well, 52 hours after checking into this hospital, we are having a baby. Lisa is fully dilated. There's a doctor and a nurse. Shelly, our neighbor, is on one side of Lisa. I'm on the other, hand under her back, hand under her leg. Every contraction, she'd hold her breath and push, and we'd squeeze her together like an accordion, like this. And after an hour of intense pushing, Cooper began his entrance into the world. He started to crown, which is a nice way of saying that the ugly blue veiny tip of his head was sticking out. The next thing that happened was very much like a scene from Alien. His head shoots out. Ah! The scariest thing I have ever seen in my life. And I'm still pissed. Five Lamaze classes, they never once said head shoots out. How hard would it have been to have taken that doll and went, ah, like that? So I'm sitting there. I'm looking at this, the crown thing, right? And then his head shoots out and I scream in front of all these people. And I'm already trying to figure out who he looks like. And I hope nobody, because he's damn ugly at this point. And about a minute later came the actual birth, which sounds very much like this. That's it, it just comes out. And boy, this is a proud moment for me. Here's my son, a tiny little old man covered with goo. And, you know, they had asked me if I wanted to cut the cord. Who says no? I'm not touching that damn cord. <laughs> but I was not going to bite it, which some people do. Just a clean cut and I'm done. And they took that turkey baster and cleared his mouth out. And they, they fixed him up. And they put him up on Lisa's stomach. And he's quite young at this point, about three, four minutes old. And I walked up to him. He's little. He's red. And I go, hey, Cooper. Hey. Hey, Cooper. And I put my hand out. And my little finger touched his hand. And he reached up. And he grabbed my little finger, and he squeezed so hard. And I started to tear up. And I looked at his hand, and I swear to you, I knew it was my son. There was my hand. A little teeny Ricky hand. No wedding ring, but everything else the same. <laughs> and I totally lost it in front of all of these strangers when they scooted Cooper up on Lisa's chest. And his mouth, the cutest mouth that has ever existed. Fuck you if you don't believe me. <laughs> is already groping for her nipple and it is what the word precious was invented to describe and I just lost it I sat down on this chair and started crying Lisa never cried once it's amazing to me it's amazing at the end she was actually taking notes in this damn journal of hers Ricky's crying I'll jot that down that's interesting <laughs> she asked if she could feel the placenta fascinating made a note there <laughs> My son, Cooper, is 16 months old now. He is so cute. You need special glasses to look at him, really. You cannot describe it, can you? You cannot describe it. I hold him. I kiss his cheeks. I, I plug into him in some primal way. It is the best thing there is. And I am so amazed that this is Rick Reynolds saying this. God, I didn't want to have kids. I didn't think I could feel this emotion because of the childhood I had. But given the childhood I had, I should have kids. I saw it done wrong. I want to do it right. I want to tell my son I love him every day of his life. And I'll tell you, I have changed so much in 16 months. It used to gag me the way people talk to their babies, you know. <laughs> Who made a poo-poo pee-pee? <laughs> That's a pretty stinky poo-poo today. <laughs> this is me now. <laughs> it is. Cooper is never Cooper in our house. He's the Cooper Pooper Man. <laughs> he doesn't go to sleep at night. He goes to CP Seepers. I make myself sick. <laughs> also, if you don't have kids, you must feel that cocky sense of freedom that I felt. You know, don't you kind of feel, what is it? I can get a slice of pizza at three in the morning. I can sell all my shit and move to Montana. I'm free. That's not the way it works. 
I can't tell you how much I look forward to driving home tonight. And I'll go into Cooper's room and I'll look at him. And he always lays just like this, like he's in the chalk outline of a dead guy. You know? <laughs> And it's the best. It is the best. Who would have believed that responsibility was a necessary ingredient of happiness? Why didn't you tell me that before? I have spent my entire life avoiding the thing I most needed. And the weird thing is, it sounds like nonsense until you're there. If you would approach me two years ago and said, Rick, you know why you're not really happy right now in life? You need more responsibility. I would have said, good point. All right, really good. Good point. God. You know what the really hard thing about this show is? I get to these points where I have to say things that are like big truths about life. And they sound trite. And I know why they sound trite. Because they are. Everything has been said before. Having a baby puts your life into perspective. You've heard it before. You know it on your own, but it is a new truth to me. Cooper's birth has taught me so much about my life. And really, I think even more about my death. The thing I have feared for so long. I think now that I have to die. Not just to make way for Cooper's generation. It is so much more than that. I think that my death gives my life scope and meaning and definition. I mean this literally. If we were not cognizant of the fact that we would one day die, we would never be happy for an instant of our lives. Why is time precious? One reason. Because it's limited. This is the way things have to be. Now that doesn't, that doesn't diminish my fear of death. It's so spooky that I'm not going to be around someday. It's a spooky notion. And when I am honest with myself, I admit that I fear life itself. Well, you know what? I think that's why God and humor were invented in the first place. You know, it really does seem to me now that at birth, we're rescued from a dark, silent place and ushered into a world full of wonder. Childhood is a magical time, free from responsibility. Hell, we're curious and filled with energy as teenagers and then challenged to reach our full potential as we become adults. In midlife, we watch as our pretensions slowly slip away, our dreams for happiness finally becoming realized. Old age brings wisdom, wonderful memories, and a passionate love of life. Good night.